Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Peter Day. The proposition we're debating is this House believes that in the long run, the West will prevail. Of course it will. How very stupid. Those are the opposed positions we're going to take today. We've got two proposers, two seconders, and then um, your interventions from the floor. Two minutes each, please. I'm going to ask, keep the... Uh, uh, proposer and seconder thing going by asking you to raise your hand so that I can spot somebody who's going to continue the argument on either side. Um, the leaders of tomorrow have already been polled. They came out 50-50. That was before they arrived here in St. Gallen. And now we've got a, a, a live poll going on now, so please vote on either side so we can see what you think as the debate begins. But first, for the motion, Mr. Pung, he's got five minutes. Well, thank you very much for this honor and privilege to speak here in front of you. My name is Che Hung, and I'm a macroeconomic analyst based in Singapore. I'm Singaporean, and odd it should be that I find myself on this side of the motion. Now, in Singapore, we often say that, you know, we're a highly westernized country, and that's really what Michael over there, my colleague and I want to use as what we mean by when we say the West. Because the West isn't just a geography, the West isn't just the set of countries that make up America and Europe and so on and so forth. We put forth to you that the West is more than that. It's a collective set of ideals, ideas and institutions that were derived from the Enlightenment a couple of centuries ago. And that's what we mean when we say Japan has Westernized, South Korea has Westernized, Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong and so forth. Because those are Western ideals, those are Western institutions, and we don't believe that those are about to die, that those are about to be challenged by any alternative. Now, I mean that in two ways. First of all, that a lot of the growth and a lot of the progress in Asia, in the East as we call it, is remarkable. We don't deny that. The growth in China is remarkable. India, remarkable. Number of people out of poverty, again, remarkable. We don't deny any of that. But the question that's important to ask ourselves is, where did that growth come from? And will that growth be sustained into the future? Can we linearly extrapolate all of those trends straight into the future? Or do we, in mathematics, say the second derivative is negative, it's going to taper off? And that's the position we take today. We put to you that a lot of the growth in political institutions, political openness, in terms of economic institutions, are all exogenous. That's why you don't see a continuous shift towards growth. You often see a binary change between very low growth and then suddenly very high growth. In China, this was with Deng Xiaoping. He opened the country up. With Japan, this started early on with a major restoration. In China, immediately we took on British institutions and moved towards that. All of these are examples not of endogenous growth, where the growth came from within, slowly accumulating momentum and then leading to a longer trend of growth. No, all of this was imported economic models, imported technology, foreign direct investment that allowed the economy to be thrust into the future. What this implies from this argument is that eventually the best we can expect from a lot of this Asian growth is to hit an equal level to where Europe and the West are today in general, America and all. But Asia, insofar as we know it today, will not further take the lead because they are unable to generate this growth endogenously, independent of the West. And then even if we say that this endogenous growth continues for at least quite a while more, I put to you that there are a lot of risks to this endogenous growth. For example, where economics is concerned, we see that in China, a lot of the wealth is not being equally distributed. And in order to deal with the social unrest that comes from food inflation being at double digits in China, the government has had to raise minimum wages very quickly at a 15% year-on-year rate every single year, such that in Shenzhen today, the minimum wage is only four times lower than the federal minimum wage in America. Now, isn't that shocking? And this just goes to show that there is a lack of a manner and a mechanism to distribute the fruits of growth in such an even and equitable manner throughout Asia. Now, obviously, the West is not perfect, but much worse in China, much worse in Singapore, in a manner that will lead to massive social unrest, right now again being suppressed. And we don't want to say the West is perfect. There is unrest there. There is dissatisfaction there. But we put it to you that because it's so suppressed through political institutions that don't allow any legitimate 
and legal mechanism for the release of all of this public discontent, it will eventually lead to social unrest. It will either force the government to be caught between two situations. Either they raise minimum wages to a very high and unsustainable level that destroys the Chinese economy, or they give up this sort of rapid industrialization that they've relied on for so many years. Now, either one of these situations portends for us not a very good picture for China. Of course, China is definitely going to continue growing. But if we were to ask ourselves the question whether China, as we know it today, under the present institutions and mechanisms, if it doesn't change to a more inclusive system, perhaps that Singapore or Japan have relative to China, that Korea has relative to China, if they don't become more westernized and accept more Western forms of regulation, of transparency, of accountability that allow people to express protest legitimately in the West, to bring people out of power in the West in a legitimate and an orderly manner, we say China will not go forward. The reason why Puo Xilai's fall from grace in China was so surprising is because it's exceptional. Corruption is endemic in China, but when it's corrected one time, it's a surprise. It's an exception. It's something to be noted and newsworthy. But in America, when corruption is noticed, yes, it is noticed, it is brought us into the media, but it's one of many, many, many instances. And for all these reasons, ladies and gentlemen, I put forth to you that unless the East changes its model and further westernizes, the, the exogenous growth it's experienced so far will not continue for that much longer. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, speaking against the motion, Mr. Krishnan. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. That was an extremely compelling argument about why China, as you see it today, would not surpass America, as you see it today. But I put forth to you that the question itself is not whether China, as you see it today, would surpass America, as you see it today, but whether, in the long run, you would have a Western-predominant system across the world. If you look at it in that way, then the question put forth, you have to look at it slightly differently. Like uh, my worthy opponent said, the conception of what is the West can be thought of as a group of ideas. Now, these group of ideas can be looked at in many different ways, economically, politically, socially. Economically, it would be equivalent of the laissez-faire capitalism to a large extent. That has been pretty much imbibed by all Western economies to some extent or the other. And this can be contrasted with the more state-directed capitalism that is rampant in many parts of many different parts of the world, including China, as well as Singapore, where my opponent is from. Now, I spent eight years in Singapore, and it is indeed a Western society, but the culture and the systems of living there are very, very different from what you would expect in Switzerland, which is very different from what you would expect in Britain, which is very different from what you would expect in the Americas. Now, what this means is that there are many competing ideals, there are many competing paradigms, and there are many, many different ways in which growth happens across the world. For all of these reasons, it is very difficult for anybody to say that the Western ideals will prevail in the long run. There are many, many different systems of thought, cultures, many different historical backgrounds, and all of these together make it difficult for us to look at any emerging economy and say, you need to westernize or you're going to die because your endogenous growth is not going to continue. Let's take a step back and look at it in a historical context. If you asked 2,000 years ago what paradigm would rule over the world, uh, most people would have said that the Roman ideals would be predominant. But no, we don't really see that now today, do we? But if you look even further back, you would have said the Egyptians would be predominant or the, or the Chinese would be predominant. At different parts of the world, till, about, till before the Industrial Revolution, Chinese GDP was much larger than many other parts of the world. But that, again, does not mean that one system will prevail over the other. Each country is unique. Each country has different modes of growth. And different modes of growth depend on their, their history, their social structure, their different ways of achieving growth. The, the Japan and South Korea example that was raised is uh, quite interesting to me, because Japan and South Korea, to me, completely predict why the Western way of doing things will not succeed. Because these are two economies that have adapted certain aspects of what you would consider Western capitalism, and have adapted them in unique ways, which are unrecognizable to most people outside those countries as Western ideals. 
When you look at Japan, almost every single article, economic or otherwise, social or political, says that they are completely different in many, many respects, and they do not do things like you do in the West, which to me says that they have found a different way of doing uh, whatever they want to do. They have, different, uh, they have found a different way of achieving growth. They have found a different way of existing as a society, and to say that that means that their endogenous growth is going to stop, is to have its pure hubris. It is for us to look at them and say they are different from us, but unless, we, unless um, they adopt the same systems as we propose, they are going to fall on their knees. One of the best examples that I can think of is when the West looks at Japan over the last two decades and say they have completely stagnated. This very conveniently overlooks the fact that over the last 10 years, Japan has actually grown faster than Europe. Now, these, when, you, when you look at specific facts, when you have a fact-based analysis of any different part of the world, you will see that their growth, their social structure, the way forward that they define for themselves is quite often dependent on their historical context. It is dependent on their aims. And to put all of these different people from different parts of the world together and say that all of us need to follow the same principles of laissez-faire economics, of following the same kind of democratic institutions that we propose, and, to, and the same kind of individualism that is rampant in the West, is to have a complete misunderstanding of how human society works. And for all of these reasons, I put forth to you, in the long run, West will not prevail. Thank you. We're now back with the motion, in the long run, the West will prevail. Mr. Feller. Uh, thank you, Rohit. Uh, that was an interesting uh, argument, uh, but uh, I don't think uh, this is about hubris and about uh, you know, the West forcing itself, imposing itself on the East, uh, you know, if you will, or the, the global South or what have you. you know, these uh, post-colonial ideas that uh, the West is, you know, uh, putting itself on the east. I, I don't think that stands up to scrutiny. Um, I'm from Australia, which uh, Singaporean Prime Minister several years ago, Lee Kuan Yew, called the poor white trash of Asia. But uh, now, uh, maybe 20, 30 years later, uh, we're seeing Singapore, as was very uh, eloquently um, described by my colleague here, Singapore is becoming westernised, Singapore is adopting western norms on its own volition, not because the West is imposing itself, not because the West, through hubris, believes itself to be better, but because people, you know, they're not seeing these as Western ideals, they're not seeing, you know, these uh, political economic norms as, as, as Western, they're seeing them as, as, as universal and desirable and, and things that people want. Uh, democracy, liberalism, capitalism, freedom, you know, these aren't, you know, things that someone is trying to impose on someone else. I know there's a lot of criticism of, you know, neoconservatism under Bush and so forth, and, you know, imposing a, a Western model on, uh, on states which uh, can't cope or uh, aren't suited to it. But, uh, you know, people are voting with their feet towards, you know, what, what we in the so-called West already have. Uh, you know, going back to the uh, example of uh, China, which we've discussed, uh, plenty of times before. Why, why are Chinese political leaders sending their children to study in the West? Why was Bo Lai's son uh, at Harrow, Oxford and Harvard if uh, the East, the so-called East, was a, a superior model? Uh, why, uh, why is so much Chinese investment going into US treasuries if uh, we're so confident that Chinese growth can continue on this trajectory forever? And why, uh, you know, why, why is there so much money in Switzerland? <laughs> Um, all these questions, you know, they speak for them, all these uh, facts, they speak for themselves. And, uh, you know, more, even more poignantly, you know, why, uh, why was a Chinese human rights activist climbing over a wall in Beijing to escape to the US embassy and not an American human rights activist escaping over a wall to the uh, Chinese embassy in Washington, D.C.? I think these things, again, speak for themselves. Western or universal values systems, norms, are things that we, we all want, we all desire, and we all cherish. And, uh, you know, that's not a, you know, statement of cultural superiority. That's just a, you know, statement of fact. Um, there's, there's, there's many things that we can learn from Asian civilizations, from, from uh, other societies, cultures, that, you know, indeed in the West we've adopted um, 
the we and you know this is part of the whole pluralistic thing which makes uh, so-called Western civilization attractive. So look, I think uh, you know it, when we see Asian economies grow, I think that's a statement that the West will prevail because as they grow, as they develop, as their economies mature, as their political systems mature, they become more Westernized. They become more like Europe, more like America. And uh, you know that that in itself says that uh, the West will prevail more than anything else. It's not about America versus China. It's about uh, it's about philosophies of uh, liberalism versus philosophies of totalitarianism. You know, we had this we had this uh, debate what 50 years ago when uh, the Soviet Union was growing much faster than the economies of the West, when uh, you know Soviet military power was um, overtaking the West, when. Uh, the, the first man in space was Russian. Uh, we, we, we said, well, the East will win, the, the East will prevail. But, uh, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a military Cold War, it wasn't an economic Cold War which uh, led to the fall of the Berlin Wall. It was that people weren't happy with that alternative system. They wanted a Western system. People were climbing to West Germany, not climbing the walls to East Germany. And uh, again, people are climbing the walls in Beijing to America. So uh, I think it speaks for itself. Um, as to the, uh, the other comments made about uh, uh, you know, Chinese civilization, Indian civilization, uh, you know, sharing a, a larger proportion of GDP at one stage in, in, in history, uh, well, that's all well and good, but uh, they weren't global societies, they weren't global civilizations back then. We live in a globalized world, and that globalized world has already adopted Western norms, and that's not changing anytime soon. In fact, that's only that's only consolidating, that's only increasing, and I think that, uh, you know, without a doubt, in the long run, the global West will prevail. Second, uh, against the motion, Mr. Garlic. Thank you very much, Saul Garlic from Washington, D.C. A patriotic American nonetheless, but I don't believe the West will prevail in the long run. What I think is interesting is that my opposition likes to point to Singapore as if it's some sort of example of where the world is going. Singapore of four million people is hardly a generalizable example for the entire world. I think we can agree, especially when we're talking about five billion people from the rest of the world. But the other things that they kind of mention are these ideals that seem to have spread throughout the world and that they actually claim them as Western ideals. But the West does not have a monopoly on these fundamental basics. Let me, let me go through them. First of all, human nature. The West doesn't get to claim human nature, like that we enjoy trading with each other. That's a fun thing to do. It makes us all better off. That's not a Western thing to do. Before the West, people were bartering and trading to make a livelihood. So they don't get to claim that one. Another one is the broad free market, laissez-faire. It's still, even though Adam Smith codified it in one book, doesn't mean that it's a simply Western ideal. I'd actually like to know what the Chinese were writing during that time, probably some pretty interesting things. So they like to dumb it down a little bit. And then they also like to say that growth is a Western thing. Also ridiculous, I'm sorry, but the reality is, is that growth has happened throughout different societies in different paces. You can't claim that that's a Western thing. So now I'm gonna go through some of the major arguments. They like to say that these Western ideals have proven in recent history that like China's embracing Western ideals, causing growth, and things are getting a lot better. But what's really interesting is that I would argue that, chi that China has grown in spite of the West, that the rest of the world is actually growing in spite of the West. Our aid practices are disastrous. Our Washington consensus has not been proven to be highly successful. Structural adjustment, not exactly a huge success. So the West has tried to encumber their growth, but people are interested in their own destiny, and they are investing in their future, and they're doing it as human beings, not West imitators. They also like to say that they're, you know, the West is importing technology, and this is clearly happening, except for everything from the social networks that the Chinese are using or people around the world are using are not actually made in Silicon Valley. People are using different things. We just heard from the CEO of a motorbike company. It's not an American motorbike company. It's an Indian motorbike company designed, made, and established for Indians. And they're actually growing and ex expanding their production out to Africa. So you can see that there's also this non-Western expansion going on that's proving that there's going to be growth in those areas. So here are some other things. I was, I was actually shocked to hear from my friend from Singapore that the rest, let's say the rest, are actually doing a lot of things really badly and they need the West to sort of save them. 
I would say that the West is doing a lot of things really badly and they're not going to prevail because we are getting lazy. As a society, we are becoming really, really comfortable with our cushy welfare plans. And the fact of the matter is, we aren't as entrepreneurial as we used to be. We're not innovating anymore. We are actually in decline. On top of that, we're experiencing really low growth from the population perspective. Demographics are not working in our favor. What's going on is you have a lot of people who are not having babies, expecting that they'll prevail forever. And you know what we learned today as well? We learned that change is constant. It's actually the only thing that's constant. To, to go ahead and assume that change is not going to happen because the Western ideals are so wonderful and prolific is also preposterous. So, you know, I, I just really want to highlight how incredibly important it is for the West to actually get over itself for a minute and start thinking about the rest of the world and learn to engage in the rest of the world in a truly productive way. The proposition set out and opposed. Now we go to the floor, and I want two-minute interventions, please. Julie here is keeping a stopwatch on how long you speak for, and we'll continue that alternating pro and con pattern, I hope. So if you want to speak, put your hands up, and we'll try. It's very difficult to identify people. I'd very much like to hear from the leaders of today as well as those cherished leaders of tomorrow. But uh, put your hands up, and we'll dive a microphone to you, and keep it to two minutes. Uh, there in the middle, uh, lady in the middle there. Uh, there's a microphone coming towards you very quickly now. And over on this side, I want somebody to put their hands up. We come to you when it's finished. Nobody yet. Okay, we'll wait. Okay, far away. I'm Alexandra from Oxford. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished proposition and full opposition. In the long run, the West will prevail. What do we mean by West? So as we heard already, it's a set of values, it's a way of living, and it's something that has been driving our societies. You can understand it in many different ways. By taking this proposition, though, if we think about all the examples throughout history that our friend Rohit mentioned as well, and if you think about Romans, you think about Greek society, you think about Egyptians as well, you'll always see these values as a driver as driving the societies and as driving their growth and as symbolizing it in some way too. If you think about our setting, well, not only I would argue that right now we are at a turning point in history because communication is completely different, the pace of so many things cannot be compared. But let's leave this aside because we don't actually need to help our argument with this. Leaving this aside, and looking back at history as well, we can see how Western society and culture has been helped by all these values and has been uprising through that. And what I would simply argue now, and actually supporting this, supporting this on the arguments that were made by our position here, is that if the uprising and the rise of emerging countries is going to be helped and has been helped by these very same values. We don't need to say that things will not go with growth, with all these things that are a fact already. We simply need to recognize how this is happening and how it will increasingly happen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, people opposing the motion put their hands up. Can be anywhere, of course. I'm looking over there. There's somebody, yes. Somebody. Thank you. Uh, hi, hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much to, to both sets of debaters for a wonderful discussion. I, I want to just limit my comments to and be very candid, actually. And I, it's, it's in, 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 in opposition to the to the motion, basically. My idea is basically, what I found a little, what I found a little interesting was it, the, the debate wasn't just limited to topics of economics. We're talking about a lot of different things, social, cultural issues. So what I want to oppose the topic and say is, the West does not have the capability, I mean, does not have, should not have the ability to call everything good about 
uh, about situations such as human rights, uh, voting, democracy, and keep a monopoly and say, well, you know what, that's Western and that's not Eastern. I think a lot of things that have originated in the East, and I don't think nobody has the monopoly to claim everything good as being the West. Just to give you an example, or to give you a fact to think, in America, women got the right to vote in 1960. African Americans weren't even considered human. They were considered three-fourths human in the Constitution of America, which was established 300 years ago, 200 years ago. In India, our Constitution gave the right to vote to women the day we got independent from Britain, including the minorities, including the tribes, including all religions. So I don't think that you can claim one side is better than the other and one side will prevail. If not anything, we'll both prevail or we'll both lose. Thank you very much. Okay. Now somebody who uh, supports the message, uh, the, the motion. Uh, you, son, can you come up on stage? Because the camera can't get the audience. So run up on stage with a microphone and do your two minutes for us there, or here, or here. Slows us down a bit, but that's what the cameras want. We're slaves to television. OK, bang on, please. Hello. Hi, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sam, and I'm studying in Queensland, Australia. Um, I'd just like to state my position. I am for the motion, and, throughout, and during the debate, I noticed three errors, or three flaws that I found with those who were against the motion. Now, uh, Rowett made the very good observation that, um, that if you went back 2,000 years, and you'd say, who'd be the power, Rome? Or if you went back 4,000 years, who'd be the power? Egypt. And he, re and he used that when he made the argument for, in the long run, who would prevail, and he said that, well, in the long run, change is going to happen. Well, let's look back in the recent history. Let's look at the past 800 years. Who have been the main powers? They've been Spain, then the United Kingdom, and then the United States. In the examples Rohit gave, he said very specific individual countries. The West is not a specific individual country. It encompasses many countries. So if there's going to be change in the long run, what's to say that it is, it is not another Western country that will take the fall? That was one flaw that I found with their argument. The second flaw, they made an issue regarding the um, emphasis that apparently our side, we were saying that, oh, there's just, that we're just focusing on China and the USA, and that there are so many other possible um, options that we need to look at, such as the Indian option, the African option, etc., etc. I'd actually say that's a weakness, because aside from the Western model, you have so many other models. How do you know which one to pick? Out of all of them, it's the Western model that stands strong. Yes, we have the Chinese model, but we don't know if it's going to last. We have another model, but we don't know if it's going to last. I've got 30 seconds to go. I'll try to be quick. The last one, um, Saul made a, made a point saying that, um, uh, we, that the West claims certain elements for itself, such as human nature, bartering, etc. That, and that's true. The West cannot claim ownership of them, but it's codified them. And I'd just like to point one very striking thing out. He said that he would have liked to have known what the Chinese were doing at the time of Adam Smith, but he was unable to say what the Chinese were doing at the time of Adam Smith because it's the West and only the West that's been able to codify its, 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 its concepts and values. Thank you very much indeed. I'll take the mic. Thank you very much. Somebody opposing the motion, please. Yes, yes, come, come forward. Speak on this side, then we know where your city is standing from. Far away. Uh, hi, I'm Siddharth from India, and I oppose the motion. I first put one point to Mr. Michael Feller, uh, which is about uh, the Chinese uh, human rights activist who jumped in uh, to the American embassy. The point that he very conveniently forgets is that the Americans were so, so scared of the Chinese response that one hour later he was sent back to the Chinese authorities <laughs> and will possibly face and, and will possibly face the death sentence. He will possibly face the death sentence. Now, a very quick uh, three rebuttals uh, to Sam's points. A very good friend of mine. He speaks about uh, he speaks Get about the Spain. The, he mouth. speaks about Spain, the UK, America, about about these countries prevailing over the past 800 years. What he forgets is that history has proven that those models are defunct. The imperial model does not work. Countries cannot expect to grow beyond their boundaries. 
uh, claim resources across the world and expect to grow. I think what uh, countries like India and China have done in the past is be more self-contained, more self-sufficient, and, and try to grow their human capital. And I think that is possibly the model for the future. And countries cannot, uh, at least the West cannot hope to go back to its imperial past where they rely on resources in Asia and Africa to grow. <laughs> Uh, the second point is, is Sam talking about uh, the Western model uh, and uh, that there are too many alternatives. I would disagree. I don't think there is a Western model. There is not even an American model. I don't think the Re Republicans and the Democrats can agree what the American model is. So, uh, uh, <laughs> very, 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 strong, uh, very strong disagreement there. And, and lastly, to the, uh, to the more philosophical point of whether one side can prevail at the expense of the other, I do believe, like my, uh, my colleagues here have mentioned, that there are universal values that all of us have to adopt. And I think the West and the East have to come together. And you will always find people from the West supporting the East, people from the East supporting the West, and together we will grow. Thank you very much. <laughs>
We have to think different from our outfits, you know? We don't need ties to be good at what we do. We don't need to be white to be smart. We don't need to be heterosexual or gay. It's all the same. And in the end, you know, I think that our hope resides that, okay, we may be leaders, leaders of tomorrow, but the fact is that tomorrow comes today. Thank you very much. Now, a proposer again. <laughs> That's two and a quarter minutes. There's somebody right at the back there. Come right forward, please. So the microphone, so the uh, cameras can see you. Afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> Ladies, gentlemen, leaders of today, leaders of tomorrow. I say with regret that the West will prevail, <laughs> firstly. Remember, for me, the West means abroad, broadly means an ideology of capitalism and liberal democracy. Why do I think that such an ideology will prevail? Firstly, well, essentially because it produces more freedom and wealth in general, okay? If we accept that fact, and we accept the assumption that people are just selfish enough that they like freedom and wealth, then we can explain why so far and for this century the West has prevailed over, for example, the socialist communist ideologies in the formal second, former second world. In my opinion, that is why the West ultimately won the Cold War. Now, that doesn't mean that the West doesn't have problems. Internally, the West has many problems. I think the biggest ones, and I'm gonna state them here, are inequality and environmental changes like clim uh, climate change, etc., due to, for example, overconsumption. Now, the reason why I think that the, w the rest will prevail over these fundamental issues is because the West has the mechanisms to adapt and change. They, and we, um, yes, thank you very much. Uh, we have seen, for example, Wikipedia, which is a solution to inequality, or carpooling, which is a, a solution to environmental problems. So, please, opposition, this is not an assault or a belief that America and Europe will forever dominate, or even that they're right in any way, shape, or form. It is simply that, sadly, the Western ideology, broadly defined as above, is good at spreading and that staying put or resisting both external and internal pressures. Are we finished? Okay, um, so get me right, please. The West will prevail, but also I want to say that it must change. And I believe that it has the mechanisms to do so, which means that to honor my, my uh, previous colleague, um, we still do need to think differently. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now we need an opposer, please. Somewhere, there's an opposer there. Come right up. Everybody's coming out. I want some more voices from over here. Although it's, one tends to think you're sitting in the right positions and you're not, of course. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Ahad. Uh, I'm from Pakistan originally, but I do study in Singapore. Uh, I don't want to get into the business of playing on words and saying, you know, the West is a set of values and it is this and it is not that. Uh, let's build up on the definitions that we have of East and West. But I, I, I also want to say that if we do follow the path of saying that West is a set of values, and I agree with Rohit that the West doesn't have a monopoly on those values. And I would like to point out one flaw that uh, was in Sam's argument that uh, the West codified those uh, values, and I would like you to please read up on Bulle Shah, who happens to be a very famous Punjabi poet, uh, and I quote from him, uh, it's a translation, so it might not sound very eloquent. Um, I quote from him that we are all children of this earth and we share its soul. And so many philosophers uh, from the Indian subcontinent have propagated that message of equality, of universalism, and of liberty. And if you also look at the Chinese civilization, if you look at the Annals of Confucius, he also said that you need to treat people the way that you want to be treated. 
So the Eastern countries, the Eastern civilizations have codified these universal values, and I would like you to please read up on those. Now, coming to the economic issue, um, I do agree that the West has given the world great economic models which have led to tremendous growth, but let us also look at the innovations and the contributions made by East. If you look at this, uh, the Japanese lean manufacturing model of the 70s and the 80s, it was a tremendous improvement upon the Western models because the Japanese, uh, in their philosophy, they have this idea of conservation and that translated to a lean manufacturing model where they were able to you know, tremendously improve upon the capitalist model of the West, which wasted resources. And those are the things we need at the moment. Therefore, I believe that in the long term, West might be able to survive. Uh, it should survive, but it will not be the dominant power, not socially and not economically. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, now, the way this is going at the moment, it looks as though whether East or West prevails, it's going to be men that prevail. I'd like some um, more women speakers up here, please. <laughs> Don't just clap, stand, stick your hands up. And I'd also like one or two leaders of... There is a... There's one over there. What? Uh, what? Okay. Uh, yes, please come up. You're supporting the motion, yes? Thank you very much. And I'd like uh, one or two leaders of today, if uh, they're too shy, I suppose, but... Uh. Hello. Hello, my name is Bao Jia. I am a Singaporean as well, but I'm based in Beijing now. I've been there three years. Um, I would give three reasons very shortly why I think in the long run the West will prevail. I think today, you know, all of us have come up to say, look, democracy is not working, you know, human rights is not working, but look at what is dictating our conversation today. It's the, West, it's the Western ideals. It's what the West have proposed to the world, democracy. You know, I've been in China for three years, but I go to Singapore and no one's talking about whether we should adopt communism. No one is talking about whether we should adopt the Indian model of democracy. So this is my first point, that the benchmark, the benchmark in conversations today around the world is still based on a Western ideal. Now my second point, why is this so? I think it's not only because we have been discussing this, but I think this is also because the Western world is pushing this through. But what is the Chinese saying? The Chinese is saying we want a harmonious world. And because the Chinese want to say that we want a harmonious world, we, the Chinese are a bit afraid of pushing this across too aggressively. And this is why I feel that the Western, mod the Western model, Western thinking will prevail because not only are people discussing it now, the Western world is pushing this across. The Western world is saying, yes, we have our financial crisis in the US, in the Eurozone. But look, you know, we are still one of the biggest trading partners, biggest trading um, 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 stakeholders in the world. And this is why I feel that if we want to say that the East will actually come up, the East have to do something. But East, you know, Asian values, Singapore, Indonesia, India, China, they're not going out in the world now and saying, look, this is the way we do things, you should follow it. And I think because of the aggressiveness of the Western world, this will prevail. Now, a third Third short point, I think this is also related to a recognition of heritage. The thing about China, because of Tiananmen incident, because of the Cultural Revolution, a lot of history, a lot of morals have been, have been eradicated. And, and because of that, you know, it's very hard for, for them to push anything that is global, that is value-based across. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now I need another woman opposing, please. And I've got one here. Are you opposing? Over here, this side, please. It, it, it makes it easy for the, uh, for the audience. Yes, since I'm standing on this side, uh, um, absolutely I'm uh, opposing this motion. Well, I think now we need some voice uh, from Chinese and from a Chinese lady, uh, as I am. Uh, people are talking so much about China. Uh, but my view is that actually the Western people should get more, uh, should get more education about East. Uh, I think there was a gentleman from Australia claiming that um, he was, I think he was influenced a lot by Aristotle, but certainly he doesn't know about Confucius. And I want to tell you that the history of China is not only about 50 years or 60 years ago, okay? The history of China started 5,000 years ago, 
and we have a long history and we have a value which is based on our long history. And they, the same to India, because when we talk about civilization, what are we talking about? Or what are the Western friends are talking about? You're talking about, you're talking about Romans, you're talking about, about Greeks, but you don't remember there are two big civilizations which, is, which are called China and India. And several hundred years ago, um, there is a road which is called Silk Road. And in that Silk Road, the greatest trade was happening between China from, to India, to Western Asia, and to Europe. And at that moment, people were not trying to impose each other's value onto each other. But why we are doing this? Where, why are we doing this thing now? When we are calling, well, we want globalization, we want a lot of coordination, we want to help each other, but still we are saying, well, Western value is prevailing. I don't find the point, because we were not like that several hundred years ago or 1,000 years ago. So what my point is that we should show respect to each other more, and also we should study about each other more. Let's get more well educated about each other's history, about each other's value, about each other's culture. That's my point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Back to prose. Somebody four. There, please. Come right on up. It's like a game show, this. <laughs> My name is Jeremy and I'm another Australian. <laughs> I'm going to give two reasons why the West will prevail. And to define prevail, what I mean is that it will last for the long term. The first reason is language. I'm going to regretfully say that it looks like the English language is, is becoming the language of business for the world. And even though I, I don't necessarily like this. I think it limits diversity. It's a fact now that Chinese mothers and fathers want their kids to learn English because it will allow them to have a better future. And we need one language. We, we need a common language so that even though there are many different cultures around the world, we need to be able to communicate. And we don't have the technology right now to translate languages efficiently from one to another. So it's looking like English is going to become the dominant language, and English is a language of the West. The second reason is reductionism. So the scientific method, which has been so helpful in developing drugs, medicines, and all of the technology that is allowing us to be in this room. We need reductionism. We need scientific discipline to continue so that we can have the innovations that we've enjoyed and will continue to enjoy in the future. So for those two reasons, the English language and scientific reductionism, I believe that the West will prevail in the long run. Thank you. Oh no, it won't, says somebody somewhere. Oh yeah, I can't see you. Yes, do come up and... Uh Stand over here. <laughs> I'm Jalan from India. I would be probably supporting the motion if it meant long run means 10 years or 20 years. <laughs> Is that the objective or your focus? Long run to us means hundreds of years. And you must, for that, go back into history. 5,000 years back, it was China which was leading. And you just see the trend, cyclical trend. The world moved to East. India, Egypt, Rome, Britain, USA. Trend is clear. Who is next? <laughs> Again, China and India. So I submit that whether economically, militarily, spiritually, in all ways, West shall not prevail. Thank you. Thank you very much. Short and sweet, we're now back to the pros for the motion and somebody somewhere. 
Yes, come forward, please. Round the pillar, tripped up by somebody on the way. grabs the microphone and stays here to present. Thank you very much for this chance to defend the West, being from the West, from Amsterdam myself. Um, I'm very proud to, to defend this motion because I think we've been talking a lot here about values and the opposition is trying to say you cannot claim these values, they are not uniquely Western. And that we admit, but the West has been the first to be able to build a society, to build a system, to build the institutions that codify and that allow us to all live by these values. By individualism, by science, by freedom. And that's only in the West that that can do. And in the future, that will be even more important because we also see that these institutions, both formal and informal, allow us to cooperate better. We see the highest levels of trust in other people, in their institutions, in their governments. We see them in the West. And that's the only place, that's the only way we can go forward, by trusting each other. And it is shown by, uh, by these facts that is the Western model that because we have these good values that, as the opposition says, we all over the world share, only the Western system can allow us to build a society based on those that creates trust, that creates cooperation, that means that we can all together grow rich along the Western model. Thank you very much. Thank you. Opposing, got a little bit of time left. Yes, come up here. Yeah. Stand on the X. Hi, my name is David. I'm from the United States. Uh, I think one of the things that's problematic about this debate so far is we're really still doing it through a Western mindset. And one of the things I think we need to keep in mind is that really what's interesting about this, this question is that there is a different or a unique Eastern idea out there. And that's the developmental state. It's the idea that you're going to have capitalism, but state-controlled capitalism. And it's the idea to emphasize a really key idea, which is technology transfer. Now, what's really, I think, a telling fact about today is that thanks to technology transfer, we're having an evening out in the world where nowadays it is common for people to have iPhones in China and iPhones in America, say. What this means, though, I think, for today is that when you look at the sheer size of China, the sheer size of India, the sheer size of ASEAN, when you look at the, the scope of this, the East will prevail automatically simply because it's much, much bigger than Europe and much, much bigger than North America. How do you compete when North America and, and Europe put together is half the size of China. So we have even technology. If we have more or less similar ideas on, on lots of things about business, about how the world should work, it's gonna come down to numbers. And when it comes down to numbers, China, India, ASEAN, Northeast Asia, they're all much bigger. So for that, I believe the East uh, will not only lose, or not lose to the West, but will actually prevail itself. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Just time for one more from each side. Yes, come up here, sir. Hello, I'm uh, Alex from uh, Canada. All right, so I will try to s to summarize all the all the very interesting pros and cons that I've heard in the last little while. I'm I'm for uh, the motion. So I think we're debating semantics here. It doesn't say who came up first with the values that we have today. I agree, there are a lot of the values that we share and treasure today, a lot of them we can find them in the East as well as in the West. Some of them were instigated by the East, some by the West. The thing is with humans we tend to have something that is called recency bias. So we tend to believe that things that have happened recently will continue happening in, in the near term as well. So with that recency bias have, uh, in mind, today, and, and today, and I mean, the recent, uh, in this particular case, recency would be the, uh, the last few decades, or perhaps 100 or 200 years, the values of the West, democracy, uh, the, the scientific method basically that is being used in the West, and all of those other things, no matter who the, the initiator was, the West, or at least the recent West, has a self-correcting mechanism whenever we have problems. And there, there are problems with the Western model. I'm not, I'm not saying it's perfect. But it is the model that right now, no matter who came up with the various 
subsections of what we d d describe as Western culture. Right now, it is the model that is superior to the, the Eastern model that has happened recently. If we were, go if we were to go back 10,000 years even, it would have been the Mesopotamian model that would have prevailed. So that would have been right smack in the middle, pretty much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. One last hand opposing the motion, please. There is one. Come up here, around here. No, one here. I'm trying to make up the gender imbalance here, so... I want to do you and so you finish. Luckily for you, you're not only making up the gender imbalance, you're making I'm up the geographical point, yeah. imbalance as well. I think to end this off, what I'd like to do and what I'd like to come forward and say is that I am from Africa and I'm going to represent Africa's views or will, will bring forth some of Africa's views, I think, because this has been very West versus East and not West versus rest or whatever you want to call it. Um, I would like to say that the West uh, or the Western model has changed, right? Like you said, it's, it's previously said it was error correcting, but it doesn't, that the way it corrects isn't based on only its own values. It uses global values. In South Africa, we have this saying that's overused, and I'm gonna bring it to you now, and you've probably heard of it before. It's called Ubuntu. And the idea is that my humanity is tied up in your humanity. Um, you know, the Western idea that they came back and they, um, they exploited people. We have ridiculous, the, the main problem with, with the Western notion that I feel right now that needs to change is the individualism. We are not individuals, we are a community and we work together and that's why I think none of us will prevail if we try to conquer each other. And that's what's been proved throughout history. And that's why civilizations fail, is because they try to control others. Imperialism, colonialism, these are all examples of this. So what I'd like to end this debate off is with, no, the West will not prevail. The East will not prevail. Africa will not prevail. Because at the end of the day, we'll all just bring each other down if that's what we're trying to do. Thank you very much. Now it's time for the teams to, uh, to reply to everything they've heard. I'm going to start with the seconders and then go to the proposers to, to finish off. So, Miss, uh, uh, we, we start with... Um, the no? eh? Do you think it should be the opposition? For, no, no, we, we'll, we'll go in the way we went. Um, <laughs> we, we'll start off with uh, Mr. Feller. Uh, thanks for the chance to uh, be the first to respond. Uh, there was... I'll respond first to uh, um, a statement about me that uh, I know more about Aristotle than I know about uh, Confucius. Uh, my undergraduate degree was in Asian history and I don't know anything about Aristotle other than that he was Greek. But uh, either way, I, I mention this only because uh, you know, we're, we're bringing up ancient history here as a kind of straw man argument. There's a saying in finance that uh, past performance uh, does not equal uh, future results. And uh, you know, just because uh, China was a superpower um, or the, you know, the biggest power um, a few hundred years ago, you know, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, you know, so was, uh, you know, I don't know, before, before Egypt, Mesopotamia, that was too, but uh, you know, so what? You know, what about the Mayans? Where did, what happened to them? So anyway, uh, but, um, moving on from that, there were really three main arguments uh, that I could see coming through against the motion, and that was that uh, you know, there's, the West is uh, bringing imperialism, the rest is bringing inequality, and the West brings environmental irresponsibility, which are all uh, uh, inherently self-destructive and will inherently mean that the West won't prevail. But uh, rebutting each of those points, imperialism, that's another straw man. Um, it's been decades, if not centuries, since uh, the age of imperialism. And, uh, you know, it's really semantics, but it's globalisation. And I think that uh, the East, or the, or the rest, is, uh, is benefiting as much from uh, globalisation as, as the West is. And that, uh, you know, if people are coming into the West, the so-called West, it's because of that process of globalisation. It's not because you know, Team America World Police is going and dominating the world or, or, or the British are uh, invading again. 
It's, it's certainly not that. As for the uh, charge of inequality, uh, China's uh, 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 coefficient of inequality is now at 0.55. Um, and, uh, you know, for anyone who's uh, walked down the street in Beijing and then walked down the street in New York or Paris, uh, you know, you can see vast difference in inequality. The, you know, the, India is surely the home of inequality, not Europe, not America. And, uh, you know, we can quote Rumi and Confucius about, uh, you know, uh, equality and, and uh, you know, human rights and so forth, but, uh, you know, uh, what, what's the empirical evidence there? And finally, as for the charge of environmental irresponsibility, certainly uh, the Industrial Revolution, which began in the West, has obviously uh, caused a lot of harm to the, uh, to the world's ecology, but uh, the environmental solutions are coming out of the West as well. I think you're getting the biggest push for environmental sustainability here in Europe, not in China, not in India, who are actually dragging their feet and are doing everything that they possibly can do to, uh, to mean that the world will not do anything about climate change. Mr. Garlick, for the opposition. All right, I'm going to start with one really small point. Uh, right in the beginning, they mentioned that a lot of Chinese students are flocking to the United States. And that is the point. They're learning science and math. They're flocking to the United States to learn a non-culture-based you know, culture -based science and math, which is going to be critical for the United States growth or for the West to grow, which is exactly not what Westerners are studying right now. So the weakness in the West is actually highlighted by the fact that people from China and the rest of the, of the world are actually coming to the United States to fill those seats, because those seats need to be filled. It was also mentioned that the West does a better job of managing corruption, that corruption is sort of this big thing that nobody talks about in the, in the non-West. But the fact of the matter is, is that the West has just done a phenomenal job of institutionalizing corruption. If you look at our systems, the special interests actually make it possible for you to bribe publicly your Congress people and totally get away with it. And the worst news is, it's actually getting worse. The situation is going to be preposterous. This year alone, you're going to find in the United States that a billion dollars is going to be spent on super PACs. This is one example. And everybody here likes to talk about how the United States is so wonderful and influential and important and blah, blah, blah. But the truth of the matter is that we're backsliding and it's really something that is probably a trend. So here's another interesting point. They said that governments will become more Western because we're self-correcting. But if we've learned anything in the last 10 years, it's that Western governments right now are so polarized and so incompetent and the democratic process is actually creating such a slow process for solving our problems that we're not likely to be able to solve the increasing challenges. For example, today in America, there's just trillions of dollars of debt. We thought credit card debt was bad and that we like to buy things. And then we saw student loan debt increase beyond credit card debt. It's like a debt race in the West. The problems are only going to get worse, and our ability to solve them is only going to get worse as well. Um, then there was this really interesting point that the cream rises to the top, that you know, in the world, there's really uh, only so many ideas, and we can really pay attention to like one idea. Uh, or sorry, that, and then the cream is really the West. That is flawed thinking. And I loved the points that were made during the conversation when we talked about how the non-West, including Africa, including India, including China, everywhere else, has innovated on Western solutions, making our systems, our ideas, much, much better. When they do that, they get to claim ownership of the future. And so we have to be innovating, and we actually have to own the future. And there's one reason why we might not. One thing I'm really concerned about is the fact that there's a breakdown in community. I had a really interesting conversation before this debate about high suicide rates. High suicide rates in European countries. High suicide rates in countries where people are living comfortably with welfare. The reality is, is that we're not looking after each other. And if we don't do that, we're in trouble. Last word in favour, Mr. Pung. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Now, we've heard a lot of accusations of problems in the East and problems in the West, but I put it to you that problems come and go, but that ideas last, well, I won't say forever, not like diamonds, but long enough. 
Now, Confucius, everyone's talked about Confucius. It's worth noting that in his entire lifetime, Confucius never got any chance to put his ideas into practice, never went into government, never actually got a chance to carry those out. And why not? Because he was never in power. And if in the East you're not in power, you don't have the power of the hierarchy behind you, you don't have the ability to implement those ideas, no matter how good they are and no matter how valuable they are. And that essentially is fundamentally the problem with a conflict-averse, hierarchical, top-down, state-driven, Eastern fundamental core that in Singapore we're trying to overcome, that in Japan they're trying to overcome, that in Korea and Taiwan they took so long to overcome before they got to where they are today. Now, what is the Western mindset? It's been accused that we're looking at all of this from a Western mindset, and it's true. Why? Because what is the Western mindset? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Western mindset. Debating is the Western mindset. Challenging ideas of the Western mindset. You telling me that I'm wrong about my belief in the West is a Western mindset because you don't get that in China, you don't get that in Singapore, or, well, you do, but then there's the Internal Security Act and, you know, you might be put away for a while. But you do get that in the West, ladies and gentlemen. And that's what we say when the West will prevail. The West will prevail not because one part of the extremely diverse West will prevail. It's not the welfare-hugging left that will necessarily prevail. It's not crazy Rick Santorum that will necessarily prevail. But it's this idea of debate, this idea of eternal innovation that will prevail. Now, Saul tells us very rightly about innovation, but where does this innovation come from? In China, in India, in Singapore, this innovation comes from the state. This innovation comes from billions and billions of dollars being poured into places, and in Singapore, what's really interesting about most of our innovation, it's just done by American researchers. We bring them in with all the money that we have, that we have accumulated by our exogenous growth models, we bring them in and then we ask them to innovate. Now the new Yale and NUS campus in Singapore was extremely controversial because Yale was afraid that in Singapore they wouldn't be able to have the open debate that they had in America. Now of course America is not perfect, neither is Singapore. Well. Not really, mostly, but not really. And neither is China, and neither is India. But where there are imperfections, where there are challenges in the future, where there are problems to be solved, where there are people to be held accountable, where it's time to look after the weaker members of society who do not have the hierarchy on their side, who have ideas but have no money and have no connections, where shall we look to for leadership? Where shall we look to for ideas and knowledge? It's not to Aristotle. When people in Iran pro-democracy waved the American flag, they weren't chanting Aristotle, no. They they were just looking for a Western model that is not based on history, that is based on modernism, that is based on debate, that is based on a challenging of ideas, and that is why we put it to you that this Western ideal will always prevail. Thank you. The last word from Mr. Krishnan. That's a difficult act to follow, but... <laughs> I'll start by saying that he spoke a lot about China and Singapore, but I put to you that China and Singapore do not comprise the world. Uh, I live in London. Before this, I lived in Singapore, and I married an American, but I'm an Indian. And when somebody says that debate is a Western ideal, I get really angry. Because if there's one thing any of you who have gone to India have experienced, is that we love to debate. <laughs> Now, I'm a scientist, or at least I'd like to be, and I love the scientific method. Now, if somebody says that scientific method would make the West prevail over the rest, I don't agree, because scientists are go after the facts, scientists change their minds when the facts change, and they look at wherever the facts apply. You can't just take something in one place, put it to another place, and say it's going to work. Now, there were a lot of points raised by a whole lot of Australians and Singaporeans who came up on the proposition <laughs> side. And I'd like to pick out a couple of key ones that I think gets to the root of this misconception about what the Western ideals actually are. One of which says about laissez-faire capitalism and the capitalist society in general. And it basically says that the human nature is selfish, Human nature is individualistic, and therefore any other society you put up will fall. And the example that is given for this is the fall of the Berlin Wall. Now, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, there were a lot of changes that were happening. One of the changes that was happening is that American parents were telling their children to learn Japanese, because they thought at that point Japan was going to prevail because of whatever the economic circumstances at the point were. If you take 
20 years ago, just look 20 years ago, if this was the situation, it is ridiculous to say that in the last 20 years, the world has changed so much that nothing else will ever emerge and the West will prevail. That's ridiculous. You think that the English is the reason that the world is going to embrace Western ideals? I submit to you the number of people in this room. Ask anybody how many languages they speak. We are debating in English. If this was 100 years ago, we would be debating in French or Latin. So it is ridiculous to say that one language is the reason for world dominance. India has more English-speaking people than many other countries that are represented in the world, and that's still not a reason why English is going to prevail. So what I submit to you is that it's not about communism versus capitalism. That days are long gone. But it's about the fact that we have enough competing ideals in the world that we do not know which one is going to prevail. And there is no reason to say that the Western ideals are the ones that are going to prevail. We have different forms of capitalism. We have different forms of socialism. We have mixed societal structures. It is not about individualism. Like my friend from Africa said, it's about community. And we are recognizing that more and more. As the world becomes more globalized, as their interdependence grows more and more, we have to solve problems together. And one key component component of this is that we have to look at competing ideas and decide which one is going to succeed. And without any compelling argument about why the Western ideals will succeed over the Chinese ideals or the Indian ideals or the African ideals, I submit to you that to, to just say that capitalism is good and freedom is good is just a poster and there is no real substance behind it. It's coming together that we'll all succeed. Don't close your eyes. Thank you. Thank you ever so much. I've been looking at the moving poll and it's remained split absolutely down the middle, quite extraordinarily. Thank you to everybody who, uh, who took part in this debate and to everybody who listened and, and, and uh, backed us up. Um, I think we'll just have to agree to disagree. Thank you very much indeed.